and defer to my friend, Representative Ingridson. Thank you, Representative Sorg. It won't stand up by itself, huh? It's a distraction. I, I think of this as I'm the fourth guy up here. I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing cleanup. <laughs> uh, except instead of thinking of myself as uh, Alex Rodriguez, I think of myself as a janitor. <laughs> uh, this has been, this is always great what these guys bring to us. <laughs> I, I could, if I think of myself as an artist, say I'm actually trying to bring some unity to this, but I can't. They already have unified it all, and I'm going to have to just bring some color. Is that okay? <laughs> we do that good, though. I'm a Boston School guy, and color is where we start. Uh, believe it or not, for those three or four students of yours that work under my, uh, one of my students over there, have you, do I know some of you guys in here? I might already, huh? Yeah, there you are. Hi. <laughs> um, so. Uh, let's see where to start. I'm a chairman of the Redress of Grievance Committee. Um, uh, but, um, and I'll talk to you about that as a primary issue here now today. This is, <laughs> I'm not good with this, with this part of it. I'm wearing my arm. I don't even hold a pallet in my arm like some guys do. Uh, I prefer to keep it down on a table, We're not wear out my arm. Uh, but let's just talk a little bit about my a couple things here. First of all, I, I do believe that the uh, that the most beautiful thing that's been invented by way of government is is, is 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 representational government. And I think the next most beautiful thing that's a and twice as beautiful as that is representative government that actually has a process called redress of grievances. There are only four states in the entire nation that have that built into their constitution. I met one of the representatives uh, from, I think it was Maryland, who has it. And I said, so what do you guys do with redress? Are you from down there? <laughs> uh, and I said, so what do you guys do with redress? And he said, do what? what? And I, he said, well, what's redress? And I said, well, I guess maybe you don't do anything with it. Do you have a committee, perhaps, a, a standing committee on uh, redress of grievances? And he said, well, I don't think so. I've never heard of redress of grievances. And I, I said, you might want to read your constitution. But so New Hampshire, used to have it, used to do a lot with it, and used to do a lot of slapping back at the judiciary with it. And, and uh, it shows up in various ways throughout our history until, of course, you get to Merrill versus Sherburn, which I, I wish I had sort of elaborated on, because I'm not good at the details of Merrill versus Sherburn, but we find it to be a rather an interesting interpretation that begins to draw, draw, draw a net around redress of grievances, fascinatingly enough. But where would, what, where would you get a greater accountability in relation to government abuses than in a redress process that's guaranteed? And I brought before you, and I hope I can get my reading eyes working here, I brought before you Articles 31 and 32, and I want to read them to you, uh, just to give you the background. You know, there's a way, I, I'm, I hope you'll understand why I'm talking about this, because it is, it's directly related to the courts, but it's not, in a, or it's indirectly related to the courts, but it's... Um, I think you'll see as we get toward the end of this that, that there's a necessity in relation to, to question two that comes out of the redress of grievance experience. But nevertheless, let me read you articles um, 31 and 2. They're really short, but this is how beautiful, this is as beautiful as representative government uh, gets. Article 31 says, uh, meeting of legislature for what purpose? The legislature shall assemble for the redress of public grievances and for making such laws as the public good may require. You notice how it separated it. One of the great grievances of the courts is that we have no clue about separation of powers, and yet that power was given to us while the courts existed. We created courts and we created redress of grievances. So it's a fascinating situation we're dealing with. But the second, but the second point is more beautiful even yet than the first one, and that says, rights of assembly, instruction, and petition. The people have a right in an orderly and peaceable manner to assemble and consult upon the common good, give instructions to the representatives, and to request of the legislative body by way of petition or remonstrance, redress of the wrongs done them and of the grievances they suffer. Do you think they mean the wrongs done them by their neighbors? It's not that, right? That's taken care of by the courts. You take, you know, a person injures you, there's a prosecuting attorney, or there's, uh, uh, you know, you, you take somebody to court. This has to do with wrongdoing by the, uh, by the people, by, the, by, the, by the, the houses, by the agencies, by the, uh, by the authorities in either branch. And um, so, 
so as I said, what could be more beautiful than, than a, a representative government? That's one that has redress, that actually has that ability. I understand the federal constitution has it, and it's never been used one time. I understand there's a group now down in Washington trying to get redress because they believe the IRS is a complete fraud and have 384 questions put together by 80-some by scholars uh, in law <laughs> that they really need answers to. And I think it's a brilliant moment. But they're having to go through this whole process of forcing redress of grievances. And they're going, it's taken them years, three, four, five years now, where they're just trying to get redress of that grievance. Well, in New Hampshire, there was a difficulty similarly, where we were simply trying to get redress. So Representative Itza and I tried to create a process. We found there was no process. Several people came in, by the way, and they're mostly coming in from the family division, which is another long story, and I'll give you a short answer to that part. But, but we found there, they, so we dragged them over to the uh, legislative services, and we said, look, we want to write a petition. And they said, what? We don't have that. There's nothing in statute that shows us how to do that, or we don't even have a process of any kind. So we find we had lost a process that had been in existence from the beginning, which had been used from the beginning, and that about 19, no, I want to say 25 was maybe the last time it was used, right? And, and something, and we do believe that Merrill versus Sherburn was the major factor in, in, in probably altering that. There's no process. So, so Representative Itzen and myself um, authored a bill in which we created a process which was turned down by the Judiciary Committee, which is, of course, <laughs> maybe, maybe that too. Were you there at the time, Representative Sorg? No? Yeah, yeah, you would have you helped it to happen, but... Um, but, uh, so where was I? <laughs> I can't carry on a personal conversation. Remember, I'm just on track. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. At any rate, they were, they were happening and they were happening again and again. Now, what had happened is we had all sorts of um, methods for it. We would actually create a special committee, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, we actually finally did get something done in the House, and the, and the House created a, a way of operating, and they were going to accept redresses. So what did we do? We accepted redress. Uh, we accepted petitions for redress of grievance into the House. That was under the Democrats a couple of years ago. And what did we do with them? We stuck them in a filing cabinet. We read their titles under the, and, and a very abbreviated title, by the way, and we stuck them in a filing cabinet. And that was it. That was, that was you got your right, right? Does it say that right? To, to, have had, to have written something somewhere and have it stuck in a filing cabinet? No, the right to be heard, right? So it was a fascinating thing and a major uh, a change. Well, by the way, and I should say this, that that, uh, that speaker of the House in those days said to her chairman, who one of whom wanted to pull one of them off and actually listen to the redress, said, you don't be doing that. You won't be doing that. That person then went off and decided she was going to try to listen to these people on the street sort of thing, and she was pulled from her chairmanship, and the next year she lost her position on that committee. Uh, the committee that she'd been in forever and ever. So there's a direct relationship. I asked her about it, whether that was true, and she said, I'm not saying anything. Uh, I'm happy with the committee I'm on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> things can get worse, <laughs> I guess. So, so that was a big surprise. However, in the last House, at the very beginning, uh, Chairman O'Brien, I mean, sorry, uh, Speaker of the House O'Brien, who had been, who had sat in on a number of these. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you this one part. We created our own little caucus on redress of grievances. We tried to call it a committee, and the, they were chastised for that. So we were advised to call it a caucus on redress of grievances. We began to actually hear these things, and we're, we're mind blown by what was happening. And I better make this shorter and just get to the point, and that is that the biggest part of the problems were coming out of the courts, as you can imagine. So when they finally, when, 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 when Representative, oh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, Representative O'Brien, who became Speaker, he created this committee right at the beginning of the year, made a standing committee, and appointed yours truly chairman, which I wasn't asking for, I didn't have time for, and still don't have time for. <laughs> but we began to then listen to these things, and it was a major eye-opener for everybody. But I want to say when we were doing the caucus, Representative O'Brien had been there, had listened to this stuff, he was well aware of it. And we believed, all of us believed together, that it was our duty as a, under the Constitution, our sworn duty, actually, to not only, not only let them write it on a piece of paper, but actually listen to it. So a standing committee, the first year we received, I think, 33 overall. Uh, it looked like it was going to be 33. It turned into a total of 27 that we heard, half of which were coming out of the courts and problems within the courts. And... Um, and the unbelievable failures, I mean, literally failures of due process. A guy would come to a hearing and, and find out the hearing had been changed in its content to being a hearing about the amount of money he was going to be paying his wife in a divorce to whether he's ever going to see his kid again. And so it was a question of custody it, and, uh, and a completely inexplicable uh, a switch of, 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 of hearings without a notice, you know, the type of hearing without a notice. And the guy would lose rights. And, and in one case, we guys lost his rights on the spot, and two years later still hadn't seen his child again. 
And, and, and then there are these six months while you're waiting, of course, to then get the, your next hearing and that sort of thing. But due process across the board, not just one type, but all kinds of them are coming through to us. And um, of course, there were other issues, but the, but the ones that tonight are just really, truly related to the courts. So uh, what I wanted to uh, uh, point out, though, is that, uh, oh, yeah, actually, <laughs> I think I'll just leave it with that. But, but uh, so one of the, one of the um, uh, uh, law, we started looking through the rules and that sort of thing. We found out that one of the rules was Rule 1.2. And Rule 1.2 says there are no rules. They say all rules may be waived. Well, the injustice of it was bad enough. It actually allowed that you could waive rules, but you need to explain it. Well, they weren't even bothering to explain it. Because if there are no rules, then why is waiving? Why is waiving a requirement? Can't you waive all rules? I mean, it's the most mind-blowing crap, <laughs> to put it in, 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 in uh, artistic terms, yeah. <laughs> and and so, so, but... So that would be bad enough. Now the courts, if they're really managing this, would have said, what the heck are we doing? And the interesting thing was, one judge did say to me, he said, he said I was at one of these hearings in a courtroom, and he said to me, you know, you guys did this. You created this problem. And I had no idea. He wouldn't tell me anymore. I asked him what the heck he's talking about, and he never would tell me. <laughs> so eventually, in a brainstorm, after a whole two years of all these hearings and finding out more and more and more of this stuff, and here, and it's all wrong. It was just random court operation. Stuff that, in my opinion, the court should have been not doing, despite the fact that we had made a major mistake. But they knew, and they weren't telling us about it. And the major mistake was a real simple one. We created equity courts. We, we created courts that say, all laws and rules, to the contrary, notwithstanding. <laughs> and then they have their, the judgment do whatever the heck in the, you know, it pleases, you know, more artistic terms use it, it might be useful. So, uh, and, and so that's where we, as a court now, as a, as a general court, are saying, okay, so we're going to correct this, right? We're going to correct Rule 1.2, for example. And what's the court going to do with it? Is it? Are they going to interpret it out of our hands? They're going to say, what are you guys doing? You don't have that power under 28A? 28A? 73A? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Too many of these. Uh, so do you follow what, we're, what I'm saying? Now, what we have found through this process is we found that we created an equity court and we need to get rid of it. We created the court, we can get rid of it. But is the court going to grab some other power in relation to courts and assert some other new power and take that right away from us? We created this court, can't we change it? You follow? Well, of course we can. We, in this case, we know we can. But the question is, is the court out of control because, they'll, because of some claim? And it, you know, I, I probably will end with just this one thing. One of the things that I was running into when this whole conversation was going up with relation to the, uh, to the Claremont decisions was how is it that, that three justices, not five, three justices can interpret, can change the Constitution by interpretation. And, and this House has to get 240 people together on the same page and go through this vast process to just put it back where it was. I mean, what the heck kind of thing is that? So I'm just trying to get around with some, some, some sort of hit the road kind of illustrations to show why, in my opinion, based on what people are dealing with and suffering with, we need to get back the power to the people, the most beautiful thing, that power of, by, and for the people, which includes power over the courts. And with that, thank you very much.